again, everybody. Welcome to the Cats and Bolts podcast here on your favorite podcast platform. We're broadcasting from the Podcast Junkie studio in downtown Boca Raton. And I'm one of your hosts, Rod Peterson. She is the other, Serena Taylor. And uh, we are two NHL enthusiasts talking NHL here in Florida. And of course, that would be the Florida Panthers and the Tampa Bay Lightning. So it is episode two. I want to thank everybody who's stopping by for the first time and also those who enjoyed episode one, where we answered five burning questions entering this 2023-24 season for the Panthers and the Lightning. This is a very special episode because Bill Lindsay joins us. Florida Panthers, great. I still think scored the biggest goal in Florida Panthers history. We'll ask him about that. And, of course, he's the current Panthers radio analyst and also an analyst on the NHL Network. And if I may, Serena, a guy that you're quite fond of and I'm quite fond of. I absolutely love Bill. I think the first time I met him, I just felt like he was one of us. You know, and having Bill come on your show, on the Rod Peterson show, and just being able to spend time with him, you just realize what a quality human being he really is. Yeah, he fits right in with what the Panthers got going on down here. And I felt terrible for him that the Panthers didn't finish off that Stanley Cup run last year after he was part of the 96 Panthers that got swept in the Stanley Cup final. So lots to get to with Bill Lindsay, and he'll be joining us in just mere moments here at Podcast Junkies. But as we catch you up with where we're at, we're through rookie camp. We're through training camp. And now the Florida Panthers and Tampa Bay Lightning are in the preseason. Ironically or coincidentally enough, heading towards a collision in the home opener Saturday, October 7th, Panthers and Lightning at the newly named Amerant Bank Arena. But Serena, before we go through all that, we had the distinct pleasure of being in Estero, Florida for the rookie tournament. That was Panthers, Lightning prospects, along with the Carolina Hurricanes and Nashville Predators. Uh, what was your takeaways from that weekend a couple of weekends ago in Hertz Arena? I was really impressed when we got all of the different rosters. We saw Canadians on there. I counted, of course, all the Canadians that were on the roster. All of them, every single team. It was about average for all, kind of about 12 guys on each one. But I was probably most impressed with the goaltending that we saw. There was a couple of different forwards that I think were really impressive, but I love the goaltending, especially out of Tampa. Yeah, and I want to get your take on what was going on on the ice and off the ice as well, because that was fun to watch what was going on in the stands. Um, hey, there were rookies, and I had some friends that were in the crowd, injured Tampa Bay players, Jaden DeRoe for one. Uh, it was killing him not to be in the lineup for Tampa Bay because people don't understand. These aren't the NHL regular stars, Serena, but these are guys trying to make a name for themselves and get noticed. And for anybody that wasn't able to play in that due to injury, not a good thing. We might not have known who all those players were, but the competition was unreal. Like, I, any hockey fan would have enjoyed it. I think that was probably one of the fastest, get two of the fastest games I've seen in yeah. a long time. You had guys just going right to the wall every single shift. It's not like the third week of the NHL season where you're going to see a little bit of a different, because you're pacing yourself in an NHL season. Here, this is your opportunity to make it or break it, and I was really impressed with everybody. I didn't see one person that wasn't putting in 100% effort. You see, and that's the point, because they were trying to earn a invite to main training camp, stick around for the preseason, and then uh, maybe a contract if possible. But the one guy of not just the Lightning or the Panthers, but I would suggest of all four teams that really stood out, was Ethan Goche, the Lightning's top pick in the draft this year from Sherbrooke, the son of former NHLer Danny Goche. I mean, some guys just have it. Right. And he had it. I would have to agree with that. He was super talented, super ready to rock. And he just didn't stop like a lot of them. But you could tell there was definitely a difference in his ability versus some other guys. There were guys that were drafted four years ago. There were guys that weren't actually part of a roster that were just an invitee to the camp. So not everybody kind of had a situation where they needed to be as good for a certain reason. Everybody was just kind of playing together. And you got to remember, these are guys that do not play together all the time. It was impressive to see. This was the NHL Rookie Southeast Showcase. And just for the years ahead, it was free to attend. So get out of the Florida heat and beautiful Estero right beside the outlet mall. And if I may, it was nowhere near a sellout at Hertz Arena. But wouldn't you say almost fans of every team were like every team was represented almost in the crowd? There were fans from everywhere. Yeah. Obviously, 
Tampa's not that far from there. For those of you who are unaware, Tampa's maybe an hour and a half, to, or two, maybe a two-hour drive. You know, I guess South Florida would be kind of the same thing. We saw Nashville fans. There was people from Saskatoon there, which that was probably the least shocking mm-hmm. of all of them because – those are the kind of people that go watch this type of hockey. Yeah, well, there were some fights, and it was just overly entertaining. And, uh, hey, who doesn't enjoy some good people watching as well as hockey watching? Now, there's some news that we need to get to, and we will get Bill Lindsay's take on it. But out of both teams, Panthers and Lightning, what I think stuck out the most was Steven Stamkos the day before training camp saying he's frustrated and disappointed that the Lightning won't open talks on extending or a new contract for him. He's going into the last year of what I believe is an eight-year, $64 million deal, and he's frustrated and disappointed about that. And I just... I didn't like what I heard out of Steven Stamkos uh, on his behalf. Like, I'm a fan of his. We talked about this last time, and I said they cannot Jonathan Quick him. There's no way. It's not quite the same thing. But when you can look at a guy like Steve Samkos, I watched Edmonton do it to Ryan Smith. They traded him at the deadline because he wanted another, like, $225,000 a year. That broke my heart as an Oilers fan. Don't do this to Stamkos. If you have to look at Pittsburgh's not doing it to their guys – Sometimes you have to appreciate those guys that are willing to go down with the ship, so to speak. Not saying Tampa's going down, but that's essentially what's happened to Pittsburgh. They're not just selling off Crosby or Malkin. they got some loyalties there, and I have to appreciate that. They're actually doing everything they can in Pittsburgh to augment that group, like acquiring Eric Carlson. Now, it's interesting, though. In Pittsburgh, it's the new year, uh, new first season with a new general manager in Kyle Dubas over in Tampa Bay. It's not the first year under general manager Julian Breezebois, but I think people, from what I'm hearing, and Elliot Friedman said it first on his podcast, if Steven Stamkos leaves, Tampa wouldn't be that upset, which quite frankly got a lot of people around the NHL, fans, media, and players going, <gasps> he spent his whole career there. He's the captain. He's won two Stanley Cups. You brought it up with Ryan Smith. I don't see it a whole lot different than the Gretzky situation. And I just wonder where you stand on this because I feel like Stamkos is the face of the franchise. It's not him who is. He absolutely and give him what he wants. Absolutely. Look, at they kept guys like Vince LeCavalle. Why would you... In my opinion, I like LeCavalle, but he's no Stamkos. Stamkos is probably one of the top three guys I would have on my team if I had to pick right now. I've always been a Stamkos fan, so maybe I'm a little biased toward that. But I really feel like you can't do that. You wonder why there's no loyalties coming from the players if you as a franchise are going to treat your players like that. That's why we're in the situation we're all in, wondering, Mm. I wonder if he's going to go. Because back in the 80s, that would have this conversation never would have come up. Well, uh, the word is that Julian Breezebois, the general manager of the Lightning, wants his own people. And I kind of assume that meant just off the ice. Clearly, that means on as well. So does that, I mean, I don't want to get out of order with my topics, but are we signaling the start of bad times in Tampa? You can't always be climbing. You can't always be climbing. Tampa's, I think it's going to be a long time, truth first, before they win another Stanley Cup. It's just, you can't always be getting better. And the situation that they're in, like we talked about last time, is that they have a situation where they have a salary cap that they have to deal with. They have a lot of high paid players. If he's looking at this from a salary cap standpoint, my opinion, Stamkos is injury prone. He's getting closer to the end of his career, but you have, he's almost to the point where you have to pick him or Hedman essentially. So, moving on. We'll see how the Steven Stamko situation concludes. If it does, and if he's playing his last season in Tampa Bay, or maybe at the trade deadline, he becomes a... Uh, That'd be a, a juicy do- one. <laughs> yeah, for a contending team. Um, listen, I mentioned we're in the preseason. The Predators... Sorry, the Panthers got off to a great start by sweeping the Predators on Monday at Amerant Bank Arena. 5 nothing and 5-2 were the scores. I was there, and... Thoroughly enjoyed it. Tampa Bay didn't get off to the best start. They lost 5-2 uh, at Carolina in their first game. But now more than ever, I don't put any stock in preseason results. And full disclosure, you're an Oilers fan. I don't see you talking about what the Oilers are doing in the preseason. right? How much stock should we be putting in this? I think that 
every year, it's becoming less and less important. The preseason is more about getting guys back into the groove of playing in a competitive environment. And I think now teams are so scared that their players are going to get hurt. So they're just kind of easing everyone back in. Hockey is such a bang, bang sport. It's not like football. Hockey, you're running for you're skating, I guess, full steam, and then you collide with somebody. So there's a lot of things that can happen. But it's a feeling out process, I think, more than anything with yeah. hockey. Well, I think we forget because every year we get lulled into this or trapped in this thinking that you got to win every game. And, you know, your comment last show about it being a fluke that the Panthers got to the Stanley Cup final got a lot of play, shall we say. But let me say this. The Panthers made NHL history in a lot of ways last year. They're the first team ever to have only been in a playoff spot for 28% of the regular season and make the playoffs. That was one. And then, of course, we can talk about the run of the Stanley Cup if you want. But it's the getting hot at the right time. Was there ever more proof than last year? All that matters is hang around and get hot at the right time. Yeah, I mean, that's like that in every sport. Baseball especially, because with baseball, I like how it's set up. If you lose a game, you lose a half a game in the standings. If you win a game, you only gain a half a game in the standings. That's why it's so important. And the way the NHL is set up right now with... There's like five different columns, win regulation, lose regulation, something, something overtime, something, something shootout, something loss over. It's too much. Mm -hmm. It's too much. Just let them freaking play. But my point is it, you're You have to play well all year. Had we're not going to switch to a baseball format. I'm not saying that it should be kept the way it is as far as points and whatever else. But Yes, there needs to be some sort of like organization as a team going, hey, we're not out yet. When Edmonton went to the finals in 2006, they were barely, they squeaked in at the last minute. And I saw, but Edmonton was a stronger team then than Florida was this past year. Like it was grinding every, really, the Panthers didn't really have to grind that much in the playoffs. They really didn't until yeah, they got well, to the we're final. We're going to have to disagree on that, but um you know, from, well, I just will say this. At the trade deadline, I think the Panthers were one of the few teams who did absolutely nothing last year. They didn't make any moves at all, mm. which was a real signal from the general manager, Bill Zito, and the head coach, Paul Maurice, that we believe in you guys. Now go out and get it done. Uh, and they did. Now, to the, to the playoffs. You hear, uh, certainly at the time, you heard a lot about the Panthers pulling off the biggest upset in Stanley Cup playoff history, which it was of a seven-game series. It was also the biggest choke in Stanley Cup playoff history, just the fact that Boston lost. Was it a bigger upset by the Panthers or a bigger choke by the Bruins? And I think you know what I'm saying. I 100% know what you're saying. I would say it was a bigger upset because Boston didn't go down four straight, not score any goals. When, when Tampa lost four straight when they were the president's cup. That to me is a bigger choke than what Boston did. Just my opinion. I feel like Boston did not choke, but they weren't good enough to win, I guess. So I'm kind of wondering your thoughts on how this may change. These, the uh, division last year, the Atlantic division was statistically the toughest division in the NHL. They had the most wins. If you add up all the wins, they had the most of all four divisions. It was the toughest. And the standings went this way. Boston won, Toronto two, Tampa three, Florida four. They all made the playoffs. And then missing Buffalo, Ottawa, Detroit, Montreal. Do Not do we see changes because we know there's going to be changes. What will those changes be, do you think? I think Buffalo is going to put up a stronger fight this year than they did last year. They're a young team, and now they're a year older. I think Buffalo is – I'm kind of surprised, honestly, that they didn't put up a better performance last year, but I think it just takes a little bit of time. As far as those standings, I honestly don't see too much being different, but knowing the Leafs, they love to choke. So – We'll see what happens with them. They've had a good couple of years, but I, I don't I don't necessarily see the Leafs finishing second. Boston, Boston's strong all the time. So they're always going to have a good effort with Boston. 
We want to tell you that we are brought to you in part by the Beach House in beautiful Pompano Beach, Florida, and Buresco, the brand new tropical outpost serving only the freshest tacos and lush jungle vibes. A quick pause when we come back. Panthers great Bill Lindsay live here at Podcast Junkie Studio. Stick around. We'll be right back. All right, it is the Cats and Bolts podcast where we talk about the Florida Panthers and the Tampa Bay Lightning. And uh, this next guy doesn't need any introduction to any self-respecting Florida hockey fan. Bill Lindsay joins us, one of the greatest Panthers ever, 777 <laughs> NHL games, Quebec, Florida, Calgary, San stop, Jose. Stop, stop. You're going to list this too long. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we only got an hour. <laughs> Billy, Happy New Year. Happy New Year. Yeah, it's a new season. Yes. Quick. Short. I'm un unaccustomed to this, so <laughs> yeah. we're, we're getting right back at it. A couple of months off, and here we go again. So hopefully the guys, we still got some guys that need to recoup and recover, most notably on defense, Brandon Montour, Aaron Ekblad. Mm -hmm. We got some signings in the off season to take care of that. And Matthew Kachuk, broken sternum, back in training camp, in games. Good news for the Panthers. So we'll see how this season starts, but they got some a little uphill climb right off the bat. Billy. You're coming in hot. Just hang on a second. That <laughs> summer was a was a short one. Yes. How was it? Summer was good. Uh, yeah. Took my time away. Got out to Montana. Spent a couple of weeks doing the learn to play programs for all the kids here at the local rinks every weekend. Uh, so took a couple of weeks out of that and went back. Spent some time up in Montana. Got a place down in the Florida Keys. Spent some time in the Keys uh, to relax, enjoy, and uh, with my wife. Wrapped it up and tried to soak it in as, as much as possible, refresh like the yeah. players do, and got a clear head, hopefully, and going into the next season, let's get this yeah. thing rolling. I'm curious. You were talking about the injuries, and I feel like – Sometimes with Panthers fan, it's a little new to them when guys go so deep in the playoffs and they get injured. They're like, oh, my goodness, what about Kachuk? What about this? Ease everybody's mind. It's going to be okay. These guys <laughs> had some time to heal. So talk a little bit more about how well off they're going to be. Ah, they're going to be they're going to be well off. This team, the biggest thing with this team that when you look back last year, the number one thing was getting that system in place. And it took a long time for Paul Maurice to get that dump and chase style, get the puck protected down deep in the corners. Once they grasped that, especially after the All Star break, this team found an identity. And once they have that identity, there is a clearness and a focus to what they want to do and coming in they don't have to go through that again they got Oliver Ekman Larson they got Dmitry Kulikov coming back they got Mike Riley signed on defense they got Mikola signed on defense so they got a extra abundance of defensemen to kind of take care of the solution early on with some of the injuries they're going to be fine but up front still very talented still can score a lot of goals Bobrovsky was the Bobrovsky we know that's the question mark again going in can he sustain the level that we saw in the postseason? So to put everything at rest, the number one thing that you're looking at is the coach has been there now for a year. Everyone knows what to expect. The systems are in place. Expect a much smoother transition to the start of this year. Well, I'll tell you something. You, now, I don't know you real great, Bill, but I know of you. I love you. And what I'm seeing, you don't really like to look back. You like to look ahead, <laughs> yeah, right? You know. Yeah. But last year in the mm -hmm. press box, there were a lot of times we – you come out, we'd look at each other, oh boy. There was some long nights. Mm -hmm. uh, Randy Moeller and I have laughed about that. So what you're saying is, and, and looking back, you see why. Because yeah. that you kind of felt like they weren't getting it. Mm -hmm. And then they got it. Mm -hmm. And that run took you all by surprise. Yes. Uh, right? Yeah. Well, so, down 3-1 to Boston. 
yeah. there's, there's the biggest surprise of all. Historically great NHL team. Uh, to, to go and to do that, what it does for you, in 96 when we went to the Cup Final, now these guys have gone through it, that experience, the belief and the confidence in the locker room just grows immensely. And all of a sudden, you got this feeling like, We've been there. Like, we can get there again. We started off that 97 season on a roll. First overall through the first 25 games, we had a trade happen with Stu Barnes, kind of messed with chemistry, but it's uh, not looking back. But I know everyone in that locker room was really, really just eager to get going and prove ourselves again, try and get back to that place. And I'm sure it's the same with this team. Once you, once you felt it, once you've been there and, and tasted it and you're on the losing side, it it, it puts a little bit more fire into, into your belly. Uh, you want to prove yourself again? You want to get back there again? Well, it's like Wayne says, you have to learn how to lose before you yeah. learn how to win. Mm-hmm. We were talking a little bit before you came on about the preseason and how it's not necessarily super indicative of what's going to happen in the regular season. Like Calgary won 10 nothing against Vancouver. What, what does that really mm-hmm. even mean? So what is your take on the NHL preseason now versus maybe what it was 30 years ago or when you played? Yeah, well, 30 years ago they came to training camp to get in shape (laughs) for the first thing and then when I was playing we had one week where we were together and we just fought for a week before we got to play now you get four or five days they skate they let the guys into it and you start playing playing exhibition games but you can go up and down every NHL roster at this point there's one or two jobs that are available Uh, if you look at the contracts so there's maybe one or two maybe three jobs kind of guys are fighting for they know what's in place and what's going to be there so the purpose of the the preseason is for the young guys to kind of establish themselves and you want to be the next in the pecking order for injuries so if you're in that upcoming role and you got a chance the veterans the preseason is all about just getting your skating legs underneath you, kind of your timing. Win loss record, nothing. It means zero. Uh, I put five percent stock into training camp out of a whole course of a season. So you start, you ramp it up, and it's for the young guys. Injuries. I want to be first on that call up list or second on that call up list, and maybe you get a chance in the NHL. You be, come out, you're the best in shape. Oh well, okay. Well, maybe we want that. So that's that's more of the purpose for me. For training camp, the other with these guys, especially going to a Stanley Cup, short off season, just limit their minutes, ice time, they're in shape, get them back and just rev them up. Now it's just about revving up slowly, slowly, slowly. So you're trying to peak again, just sort of like you would want to peak for playoffs. You just raise that level in training camp inch by inch. We're kind of just talking about training camp stories. There haven't been a lot, but I need your take on the Steven Stamco situation. Just sitting there across the state, Stammer on the day before camp saying, yeah, I'm kind of frustrated and disappointed. They won't talk about my contract here. When the general manager told him they weren't going to. Yeah. Yeah. Like, where are we going here for Tampa, if you're Tampa Bay? Uh, big. Uh, can you imagine Steven Stamco? It's not in a Tampa Bay no. uniform. Uh, no contract extension. The question mark. Part of this becomes around, when you look around, is the agent and they want a specific salary. And where we have less taxes in certain states, they say, well, ten, you know, they try and work around that. But the NHLPA, they want the, the contract to be the contract and the number. And so you have to see them where they're at with all their players just signing Sergachev. And Stamkos has to fit into this puzzle. And Julian Breesbaugh said he wants to see where we are. Financially, <laughs> yeah, yeah, financially and everywhere in five, six months and kind of take it that way, but not to go and directly approach, approach Stamkos and open negotiations. That's the biggest surprise to me, at least not have dialogue to shut down dialogue immediately. Uh, there's con- there's concern there because you would think a pl- person of his stature would have some dialogue back and forth of, okay, what we're trying to Julian Breesbaugh well, just said no and, right. and said, well, we'll take a look at it, you know, in five, six months if you're Stamkos and all this tenure and all this time, I'd be sitting there and saying, well, at least let's see where we're at. Yeah. That'd be my point. Is but, he going into the year disgruntled, do you think? Would you, if you were in his skates? Nah, no. It's Steven Stamkos is going to get paid. Um, he wants to be a lightning. He wants to be a lightning forever. It's going to have to get worked on, but when you put the skates on, you you are salaried. You're an employee. You're getting paid. You're a professional. You got one job. Disgruntled, I don't care. What, my, my personal opinion, 
you got a salary and you got a job to do go play you do your job it's it's you 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 have a you have a responsibility to the guy beside you you have a responsibility to your teammate that and Steven Stamkos is that kind of person when the puck drops you're going to you're going to get what Steven Stamkos always gives you, I believe, is, is his best effort. And where the chips fall at the end, that's for him and Julian Breesbaugh to work out. Uh, yeah, I agree with you. I don't think he's that kind of a person that's going to back out. on. I really don't know too many hockey players that would, to be <laughs> honest, right? But from a Tampa standpoint, I feel like they've been very a respectful franchise and they've mm -hmm. always seemed to have treated their players well. Like we we're talking about LeCavalle and mm -hmm. all those guys that have been around forever. So from a Panther standpoint, talk about it from, you know, what you felt as a player, kind of the things that you've seen evolve since you were a player and kind of where it is to now. Well, the money's yeah, the money's changed a, a lot for some of these, these top tier guys and, when I looked at back at the Panthers and the organization, I, that I always knew as a player that I'm a commodity, um, no matter what my salary. And you can you've talked, you mentioned Wayne Gretzky. Wayne Gretzky got traded, right? Oh, well, so, I know. <laughs> yes, you know. So um, it's open. If you looked around the history and just walking away from from players, it, it happens from time to time. If they feel that's in the best interest of the organization, you have to understand. I always knew as as a player that. I, I'm here with this organization, but I'm a commodity. Of, you know, I'm a commodity of that organization. So what I bring to them and what I offer is, I would like to stay with them. If they decide to walk and feel that it's better the other way, that, then tough decisions. That's where it's different to me. Is that there is loyalty to some degree, but if they feel that it's right and it's time to cut the cord and it's time to walk away from that person and change our dynamic, there's more of a willingness now. To, to do that uh, from everyone for just and the big reason for that is to me is the salary cap. We didn't have that hard cap in place that says this much money. That's it. When you have a hard salary cap in place, you have to make hard decisions at times. That's the biggest change. You talk about treating players well uh, here near the end of last season. When we did an interview like this, you said the Panthers are set up well for the immediate and long term future and they are, right? Bob's locked up. Kachuk's mm -hmm. locked up. Barkov's locked up. You just look at this team. It was nice to see them playing in the preseason the other day. It didn't yeah. mean anything, as you say, but it was nice to see them out there again. Yeah, it is. It's nice to to get there and Samuskevich out of University of Michigan. Yeah. I talked about jobs being open. One of the kids that has a possibility. And the Panthers are in a situation that they're going to run up into some salary cap uh, issues here in the next year or so that they'll, they'll have to look and try to circumvent and trying to figure out with players that are going to be up for new, new deals at times, Montour, Forsling, fall into that kind of conversation. So you're talking about Stamkos, and Bill Zito is going to have to manage this as well. And it's, 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 if you're up there and you're a contender and you're spending towards the cap, it, it means a lot. But to see them out there again in preseason, just the team and the excitement around here in South Florida, it's There's boomed, yeah. So it's it's yeah. it's here. We're uh, sold out the lower section in the lower bowl, which is awesome. First time ever. We're gonna have a good fan base. They've earned it. Four years straight in the playoffs. A long time. Looks like they got another chance to get back there and do the same kind of things they did last year. So that's why it's exciting to see them back on the ice again. A couple of last quick burning questions. You talk about jobs. Nobody cares about the goalies, but me and goalies. But the backup job. Is it number one? Can you talk about its importance? Mm. Because we look around the NHL and I've had people say, Aiden Hill. Raw, yeah, it's a very important <laughs> job. Yeah, he was a backup, one of Stanley Cup. He was Cup. a third stringer. Right. <laughs> so here, Spencer Knight, fourth. It's yeah. a big, yeah, whatever it was, number one now. <laughs> yeah, yes. <laughs> uh, but it's a big deal. Who is Bob's backup? Yeah, Spencer Knight. The new, he's the guy the new he deal wants kicks it. in. Yeah. It's, it's, here's a big year for, first off, for Spencer Knight, health. That's what we're wishing mental, for. Physical. Yes, mental, physical comeback. I don't care about anything on the hockey side. You come back, you come back healthy as a person. That's, that's what we want for Spencer Knight. If that's all true and he's in a good place mentally, physically, he's ready to roll, his new contract kicks in, now it's a big year for him. You, you, you are into that where you have to prove it. Sergei Bobrovsky's getting older. If you looked at the games... 
I would go 50-35, yeah. somewhere in that area. If you want 35-year-old goaltender Bobrovsky, you're looking at the importance of a backup. Bobrovsky, if he does stay healthy and plays those games, even 35 for Spencer Knight, you got to come in. You got to you got to win some games. Uh, you got to be able to elevate your play. Got to be there. So if you and he's kind of a diamond that, that needs big time that, that needs some polishing, but the diamond's there. Can he polish it, and can the Panthers polish it in the right way? If they do that, then 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 they have a chance. But they definitely, definitely, this team wants wants deeply to have Spencer Knight not only be the backup, the next one, but prove that he has a chance to be the next one. And with him physically and mentally healthy, there is a chance of that. But it's up to him to show that. Rod and I were just talking the other day about the psychology behind being an athlete, especially a goaltender. Think about how much it's changed putting mental health in the forefront for professional athletes now compared to what it was 50 years ago. Yeah, mental health, I can, it's hard. Yeah. yeah, and it's good to have it in the, for, in the forefront. Uh, mental health, if it's an injury up here, it, it affects everything. And the mental, the physical part of the game, everyone has the attributes. But even when you're going through a course of a season and grinding, the toughest part of it is mentally overcoming all that and being mentally ready to prepare, get yourself out of slumps. So if you're having some issues with your health, with your brain, on the mental health side of that, it makes it almost impossible, the, the challenges, because mental health can create uh, not only a minute-to-minute -minute struggle in a day where everyone just kind of goes through your day. If you're struggling with mental health, it can go from minute to minute to minute to minute that you're trying to get through that one minute where I would say a minute sometimes can feel like an hour. An hour can sometimes feel like a day. Now you combine that and now you're trying to play hockey. How do you try and put that all together when you're lacing up your pads and you could have some panic disorder going on. You could have something. It's you're just how I mean, I'm not. The, the hockey game seems secondary right now. I'm just trying to get through, and you're trying to do this and play in front of 20,000 people. That is why mental health and what we've done in bringing this awareness to everyone is so important. Uh, it's, it's, a, it's, if, it's hard if, if you haven't kind of gone through kind of stuff like that, but to put it out there and do it, it's, uh, they've done a lot of God, good work, and it is of the utmost importance to have to have that first and foremost, uh, because it, I, I've had experiences. It can be yeah. agonizing. At least we're talking about it now. And courageous of Spencer to say, "Hey, OCD was what he was dealing with." Mm -hmm. And I was the second I heard that, I'm like, "Well, I hope they call Clint Malarcha because yeah. that's where it all started with Clint." Yeah, you know what I mean. And back then, you yeah. think it was checked? No, I can tell you the yeah. answer to that. No, it was not. Um, Serena, think of your last couple questions. We'll let Billy go. I got one for you. Forever known, it says on your Wikipedia, scored the biggest goal in Panthers <laughs> history. It's still there. It's still there. Is it still the biggest? I think it no. is. Because it's you, I think it is. Yeah, I'll take it. You know, I've lived off Are you and Matthew time. Kachuk tied for yeah. the biggest goals in Panthers? Matthew Kachuk's run puts it all. But the, if you encapsulate the whole thing. You think so? The goals and everything, yeah. <laughs> that's So I got a moment, maybe. And he, he's probably got bigger goals, too. It depends whatever if mine mine was special for that moment but the big goals the big times even even Carter Verhage those two what they did in the in these playoffs they kind of encapsulate anything that's ever been done before in Panther history uh Dave Lowry had a good run when we went night but we were, there was nothing nothing so you're saying it's Kachuk this, Kachuk what he did it's that's stuff of legends uh other than holding the cup but yeah it, as far as panther legend and lore goes that's, that's his best you've ever seen in panther history wow yeah that's the best hockey you've ever seen in panther history it was a different style mm. probably than i think anybody was even expecting a year ago we were laughing well not laughing because when the calgary when the trade happened we were like oh we thought the flames won it in a row yeah i'm like oh great <laughs> here we go so, uh, so did they yeah. yeah, and look at the difference. It's just like we were talking about that previously at the Beach House about the difference in what a dressing room guy he is mm -hmm. and how important that is. And it's just it goes along with the mental health thing. That's the kind of stuff that has to roll, too. Yeah, you got to have it. You got to have that glue. He's fun. He's he's fun. He's 
is Boston. Um, it's I mean, there, it's not it's not a cockiness, but it's a belief, you know, an inner belief yeah. in himself. Yeah, it's a confidence it, you yes, have to it, have it's for a sure. Confidence and kind of a the way that he carries himself, and it kind of rubs off onto everybody. He makes sure that it's light in the room. He knows, and he's not afraid. Hey, we got something here. I I can take it right to the coach. I can take it to the GM. Some if there's a fourth liner got some issues, go to Matthew Kachuk. Kachuk, hey. If, if, if it's appropriate, I'll bring it to Paul. You don't have to do it. I'll, I'll address that. You, you, you don't have to do it. And I'll bring it up in the, the appropriate way. Uh, he's got that kind of attitude, that kind of leadership, and he does it on the ice with the way that he plays as well. So it's, uh, it's a great combination to, for him, what he brings in the locker room, the attitude every day, the smile, the work ethic, and the, the production on the ice is there to, to back it up. So when you go talk to him, it, you, if you talk to him in the locker room, he says, hey, just kind of watch what I do. As a leader. Yeah. But he's not the captain. I, I can't let you get out of here without asking you, Barkov, in the playoffs. Could he have given more, or were you satisfied with the play of the captain last year? I was satisfied because there was some stuff with Barkov that I believe some sickness, illness at times that, that was going through, and he had to get through it, and it's good. It's it's. It's always good with Barkov. It's good at both ends of the rink. It's it's solid, and you kind of look and you pick, and the numbers sometimes aren't there. Then all of a sudden they they are there. But Barkov is so consistent in what he does at both ends of the rink. Uh, he gives you a chance even without scoring. The way that he plays defensively kills penalties. If I'm Paul Maurice and I'm looking down that bench, Matthew Kachuk, there's a whole different dynamic with Barkov with the size, with the matchup. If I need someone to sh shut down someone on the other team, look, I'm looking at 16. If I need someone to kill a big, big penalty, I'm looking at 16. It's There's so many little details. If you watch him play every night, the little details in a game, and it was the same way in the playoffs. The details are always there for mm -hmm. Barkov. He, do he, doesn't, he doesn't chase for goals or points. If it means sacrificing a little bit, this way or taking it back and maybe saying getting criticized a little bit he's not going to shy away from the the details of the game he, he's spot on with everything that he does and it's a very simple approach but that's gonna that's Barkov and that's what you're gonna get the details see Serena okay we always argue I have a this. question though this is this is <laughs> this actually made me think about this Dustin Brown was the captain of the LA Kings for a long time. Yeah. They ultimately ended up, I don't want to say stripping him of a letter because it wasn't anything bad, but he just essentially kind of got overtaken as captain. Do you see that happening with Kachuk? Do you ever see Barkov? And again, I don't want to say losing the C, but it sounds like Kachuk is heading toward captaincy of this team. Yeah, there could be a point in day, but Barkov is is fine. It's it's to me, it's a good yin and yang. I had two different captains right at the start of my career here in, in Florida. Brian Scrudlin was kind of guy energizer bunny that never stopped, never stopped talking either. <laughs> <laughs> so it was always constant. It was always constant, and had some good good guys underneath him. And then I had Scott Mellenby, kind of in a Barkov mode, very quiet, rarely spoke. Uh, just let, let what he did on the ice do the speaking and had good people around him. But when you spoke, you listened. And I, th I believe Barkov's getting to a point that when he does rise up in that dressing room, does want to say something, people will listen. Uh, it's a good dynamic to have a guy like Kachuk beside him to learn by. But Barkov is a leader growing into his role. I have, I have no problems with him still still wearing that. The, you, you can say, yes, it's pointing that way. But to me, Barkov is he's, he's grown into his role and has got a good command in that dressing room. And to have someone like Kachuk beside him is only going to help that cause. He can be the guy that's uh, going all the time. And Barkov, when he, when he speaks, he'll probably use his words wisely. And people will, will listen, right. like E.F. Hunting back in the rare. day. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, well, that's got it for me. How about you, Serena? I'm good. I could chat with Bill all day. <laughs> yeah, I'm we'll sure. do it next time. Can you reach and grab him that gift card? This is yes. from Baresco Tropical oh, wow. Outpost, serving only the freshest tacos and lush jungle vibes. And I know oh. you love the beach house as well. So love it you all. take you the crew the down there. You guys Billy. are the best. Yeah, of course. Yeah. Yeah. Thanks, Thanks, Bill. Thank Appreciate you. you. We'll see yes. you at the rink. Thank you, Bill yeah, Lindsay. Yeah, we're getting ready uh, to roll. Yeah. Thank you, Serena. And we'll see you.
you, everybody, at Amerimbank Arena and Amelie Arena, and we'll see you next time here on the Cats and Bolts podcast.